Hello and welcome back to the third lecture in this series on eco-modernism, the philosophy that argues that the best way to tackle the environmental emergencies that face our species today is to use all of our technological ingenuity to find new ways of living in balance with nature. Today we'll be looking at probably the most widely known technological solution to reducing our carbon emissions, and that's the building of renewable sources of energy. Primarily I'll be talking about wind power and solar photovoltaics, but I'll also cover other sources such as hydropower, geothermal, tidal and wave power and biomass. All of these are currently being used to reduce the carbon cost of our electrical grids, and all of them will be expanded in the future to produce a significantly greater proportion of our energy supply. These are all undeniably valuable technologies, but how far can we take them as solutions to climate change? What about the argument that the benefits of these technologies are outweighed by their downsides? Are renewables too variable and unpredictable to ever be used to power a grid? Will they always remain cheap or might they end up costing us in the long run? And, as an interesting aside, how will the shift from burning hydrocarbons to renewable sources of power shift global politics in new directions? Let's get started. If we're going to start somewhere, what better place than the most basic question? What are renewables? Those of you with a background in science will know that energy can't be created from nowhere, so all sources of energy are really just changing energy from one form to another. For oil, gas and coal power, for example, it's obvious what's happening. We're changing energy from a stored chemical form to electricity and heat to power our world. That's how we've done things for a great deal of time, and we know now that it's been extremely damaging in many ways. The carbon dioxide is warming our world. The environmental damage caused by extracting these substances and transporting them around has been vast and continues to deface our planet. And the pollutants released into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels cause millions of deaths annually due to damage caused by inhaling small particles into the lungs. But the one thing that truly sets aside fossil fuels from other sources of energy is that they're extremely limited. That is, they will run out soon. Even without the pressing environmental concerns, we would have to change to a different way of powering our civilization because fossil fuel reserves are limited and are running low. So pretty much every argument stacks up against fossil fuels. We have to stop using them urgently. The alternatives, then, are power sources that will not run out, or at least that won't run out within a reasonable timescale, say millions of years. The laws of physics tell us that we can't have a truly infinite source of power that will never fail, but we can get to such a long timescale that it doesn't practically matter. Renewable sources of energy are just that. They're sources of energy that don't rely on severely limited source of fuel to power them, but which can be run indefinitely, at least on human timescales. Solar power, for example, relies on the sun continuing to shine, the sun shines because it is burning through its reserves of hydrogen through nuclear fusion, so in a sense it's a limited fuel source, but it will continue to shine for several billions of years into the future, so there's no need to worry about that running out just yet. One last note, the term renewable doesn't necessarily imply clean or safe. Renewable is purely a term that refers to the expected useful lifetime of any power source. As it happens, most renewables are extremely clean and safe, but we'll go through that as we encounter them over the next few slides. The first and probably most well-known renewable energy source is solar power. The Sun has around 4 billion years left to live, so it's basically going to be around forever as far as we're concerned, and it irradiates this planet with a fairly consistent flux of high-energy solar radiation at nearly 1,400 watts per square metre. That's roughly enough to run the average home, but that's reaching the upper atmosphere. Now, a lot of that is absorbed by the atmosphere or reflected back into space. And the exact amount reaching the Earth's surface depends on those factors, plus weather conditions, plus the latitude on the Earth and the season of the year. So all figures are going to be very rough, but it's a fair estimate that when you average over the entire globe, that at the Earth's surface on a clear day, the amount of energy reaching our solar panels is roughly 1,000 watts per square metre, or a kilowatt per square metre. Now, our solar panels won't generate that much energy because they're not 100% efficient. That is, only a fraction of that incoming energy is available to be converted into electricity. Currently, the best solar panels are achieving roughly 20% efficiency. So from that 1 kilowatt per square metre, we get roughly 200 watts per square metre of power generation from solar photovoltaics. I should clarify here that solar photovoltaics, 
though the most common way of generating electricity from sunlight by converting it directly to electricity, are not the only way to use solar energy. We can use solar energy to heat water directly by exposing the water to the sun, usually in black containers or coils of tubing to maximise absorption. We can also use the sun to heat large quantities of fluids, which are then used to drive turbines, generating electricity in a more mechanical way, like a conventional power plant, but with the sun heating the water to turn it to steam instead of using coal or uranium to do so. In the UK, solar power has boomed over the last decade, going from 27 megawatts installed capacity in 2009 to 13.4 gigawatts in 2019, an increase of roughly 500 times. These statistics were provided by the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change. Globally, total capacity reached nearly 600 gigawatts in 2019, according to the International Renewable Energy Agency, an increase of a staggering 100 gigawatts on the previous year, and a factor of 20 increase in the last decade. The trajectory of solar power, it's fair to say, is exponential, and the cost is so low that it pays for itself extremely rapidly. Looking at my own personal experience, the electricity I pay for at home is roughly 15 pence per kilowatt hour, and my modest 2.7 kilowatt solar system generates somewhere in the region of 3,000 kilowatt hours per year on my rooftop. The value of that electricity would therefore be roughly £450 a year. The system today would cost around £5,000 to install, so that generation is producing roughly 9% return on investment, which is an extremely appetising rate in today's weak financial markets and it also means it would pay for itself in about 11 years. But this presentation isn't just about the good, but also the bad. And the obvious bad with solar power is that it only generates power when the sun is shining. So nothing at night, not much when it's cloudy, and a lot less in winter than in summer, with the difference increasing the further from the equator you live. Although we do generally use more power during the day than at night, the difference isn't that stark, so in order to make the best of a solar system, it needs to be paired with a large battery storage system, which would probably double or triple the cost of installation. We'll talk more later about the intermittent nature of solar and wind power, but it is a huge challenge. The second thing to worry about with solar power is that it takes up a lot of space. If the sun provides roughly one kilowatt per square metre and solar panels are 20% efficient, it follows that we need roughly five square metres per kilowatt of peak energy generation. In the UK, the capacity factor, that is the fraction of that theoretical peak that we're able to reach, is roughly 10%. So that means we need 50 square metres per kilowatt on average basis. That's a lot of space and it provides enough power to keep maybe one decent sized house going but it should be obvious that we can't set aside 50 square metres for each family on Earth because that would be an enormous amount of land. However, we don't actually need to go that far. For a start, solar panels don't have to take up any land at all. We can just put them on our roofs, which is just empty space that was not used for anything else before. We can also put them on pasture land and allow animals to graze around them. And of course we can put solar plants in arid desert land where not only is it impossible to grow crops or graze animals, but the capacity factor is much higher because of the weather, and therefore the amount of energy generated per square metre is higher too. In fact, there are now even floating solar farms sitting on lakes. Combining solar panels with reservoirs would provide a great way to protect the precious reservoir water from evaporation caused by the heat of the sun, and also generate power to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Plus, situating solar panels on a body of water keeps the solar panels cooler, which makes them more efficient. One last point. We should note that coal and gas power plants are much more constrained in their location. For a start, the land used by the power plant can't be used for anything else, and it has to be fairly near a source of fuel, ideally, especially for coal plants, which further limits the places we can put one. We certainly can't put them out of the way in low-value deserts, for example. So the land use of solar power isn't actually all that bad, especially if you put them in sunny countries, which you really should be doing. But the UK doesn't get that much sun, so most parts of the UK aren't really great for solar plants. But one thing we do get a lot of, especially in Scotland, is wind. Though the UK does poorly for solar power, largely because of its northerly latitude and cloudy weather, it is a world leader in wind energy. Historically, wind energy has had a significant head start over solar power and currently generates roughly twice as much power as solar worldwide. Unlike solar, it can operate by day or night, and in all seasons of the year. But like solar, its generation rate is uneven. 
In fact, wind power is much less predictable than solar power because we can't even overlay predictable seasons and day-night cycles over the patterns of generation. This graph shows the wind power generated in the UK over the last month, and as you can see, it's extremely erratic. Wind and solar are both very cheap. The US Energy Information Association provides these numbers for the cost of common sources of power generation per megawatt hour over the last 10 years, and you can see that onshore wind and solar PV are the cheapest options, with their prices dropping by a vast amount in just this one decade. The UK Government Department of Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy looked at the projected cost of energy generation in British pounds per megawatt hour five and ten years into the future compared with gas turbines with carbon capture and storage. And the difference just five years from now was already enormous. Five more years, and the difference has increased still further. Because of this massive drop in price, globally we installed roughly 60 gigawatts of wind power in 2019, reaching a total of 650 gigawatts worldwide. If that were a country, it would be the 10th largest energy producer in the world, just behind Brazil. In terms of space required, wind power is a tricky one to estimate because, just like solar power, the land on which wind turbines are placed can also be used for grazing or for growing crops. And let's not forget that wind turbines can always be placed out in the sea. In fact, the UK currently leads the world in the capacity of offshore wind installed, with plans to increase that level significantly thanks to its high offshore wind resource, long coastline and significant area of shallow offshore seas. The UK government announced in early October 2020 that the UK would build enough offshore wind capacity to power all homes by 2030, a target of 40 gigawatts. So the benefits of wind power are obvious. It's extremely cheap, it's clean, it's renewable, and it can be positioned offshore, which is often close to the places where the power is needed most, near coastlines. However, it also has its downsides. Like solar power, it's variable and somewhat unpredictable, and like solar power, it takes a significant investment up front in resources to build each one, not just for the enormous metal pillars and the tons of copper wiring and the giant fiberglass blades, but also the thousands of tons of concrete required for the foundations, plus all the fuel required to build those components and transport them to site, and the fuel required to take engineer crews out to sea to maintain them if they're located offshore. Eventually, the maintenance boats could be made electric, but for now they're all burning the dirtiest of diesel fuel. Plus, just like solar panels, you obviously can't put wind turbines just anywhere. There are lots of places in the world where the average wind speed really isn't that high, and the turbines would not generate much energy. You wouldn't put down solar panels in northern Scandinavia, you'd put them in Morocco. Similarly, you wouldn't put down wind turbines in countries around the equator, where wind speeds are usually low, Instead, you'd put them 40 or 50 degrees away from the equator, or just offshore where a lack of obstacles allows the wind to gather a much higher speed than on land. There is also an aesthetic argument against wind turbines, given that they are very large structures and hence visible from a very large distance. Some people find them unattractive, so especially onshore wind farms tend to meet with significant resistance from those who don't want to see their local views enhanced in this way. And finally, a more recent argument is that wind farms cause excess bird deaths when birds, and sometimes also bats, fly into the moving blades, especially at night. This is certainly true, and a lot of effort is going into minimising this, especially by choosing sites more carefully and making the turbine blades more visible to birds. This 2009 paper estimated the number of bird deaths caused by wind farms in the US at roughly 15 times lower per gigawatt hour than even coal plants, and roughly comparable with nuclear. This 2013 study by the Canadian Journal of Avian Conservation and Ecology put the number of deaths into context by pointing out that over 95% of all mortality was caused by cat predation and collision with windows, vehicles and transmission lines. In fact, here's the full table. Feral cats, 79.6 million bird deaths. Domestic cats, 54.88 million bird deaths. Powerline collisions, 16.18 million bird deaths. Building collisions, 16.39 million bird deaths. And there, right down at the bottom in number 12, wind energy, 13,000. It's 13,000 more than I would like, but it's negligible compared to the vast numbers above it. 
Canada could afford to increase its wind turbines by a factor of a thousand before those numbers would start to get alarming on that particular scale. Interestingly, by the end of 2013, when those numbers were calculated, Canada had installed 7.8 gigawatts of wind energy capacity, providing enough power to supply roughly 3% of their total requirement. So even if they built enough turbines to power their entire country purely from the wind, the estimated bird deaths caused by wind energy would still be 40 times less than those caused by collisions with buildings. At this point I think it's worth covering this argument of how unpredictable solar and wind power are, because it's clearly their biggest drawback and actually does create a significant technical and financial hurdle. I've said that solar and wind power are the cheapest to install, which is sort of true, but that's only at first. While they're minor contributors to the energy mix, then they work out really well, because every single watt they produce is useful. But as they start to get a larger share, then the amount of useful energy drops, and the price per kilowatt hour increases significantly. This is a reasonably strong argument against aiming for 100% renewable energy production in most countries. Not that it can't be done, but there are much more cost-effective zero-carbon strategies to aim for. Let me talk you through that argument. This image shows the rough distribution of energy demand on the power grid in the UK. It's similar in other countries, so obviously there are regional variations, and the exact values will differ based on the size of the country and the season of the year. These figures are taken from the National Grid, the organisation in charge of maintaining our electricity network, so they're pretty accurate. I picked a day at random, which turned out to be September the 1st, 2020. You see that demand is highest during the day, at a maximum around 8pm, then drops off again, reaching its minimum at 3 or 4 a.m. So let's say we start introducing solar power to this mix. The blue line shows the remaining demand after we subtract the energy generated by solar power during this period. Clearly, it was quite a sunny day. The solar power, as you see, takes a bite out of the demand in the middle of the day, but by the evening peak, the sun is largely finished for the day, so that remains high. All of that evening peak energy demand must be met by sources other than solar. But as you can see, every watt of that solar power was put to good use. Now let's see what happens when the UK hypothetically increases the amount of solar power it generates. Let's multiply our solar capacity by four. And you can see that something important has happened. Between the hours of roughly 10am and 1pm, we're generating too much power, more than we require. Consequently, that energy is not being used, it's wasted. So although we've built four times as many solar panels, we're not getting four times as much useful energy. And you can also see that the evening peak remains, because four times, basically zero, is still zero. We could increase our solar capacity again, increasing to six times the original capacity. Now all our requirements between roughly 9am and 4pm are fulfilled, but we're wasting even more energy so the majority of the extra capacity we added to increase from four to six times our current capacity is wasted. So that most recent capacity addition has actually been rather expensive. We're only using maybe roughly half the power we paid for. That's all very well, but you're probably saying now, well, what about storage? A very good point. Storage is a vital part of the energy puzzle. What we need to do is gather the energy that we are wasting in the middle of the day because of oversupply, store it somewhere, and then use it around 8pm when we most need it. And that's exactly true. But storage is expensive. So if you want to actually make use of that midday sun, we need to spend a whole load more on giant batteries or some other storage mechanism, which makes the energy generation even more expensive still. On the day in question in those graphs, total demand was 1.1 terawatt hours. Total solar generation was roughly 100 gigawatt hours. So we would need to multiply our solar power capacity by 11 times to generate the total power required. And that power would all be generated during sunlight hours, so we'd need to spend a huge amount of money on storage to get the electricity stored for when it was required. And bear in mind that this was a reasonably sunny day. What happens when we need to power our country in winter? Exactly the same argument works for wind power too. There are subtle differences. Obviously wind power isn't concentrated in sunlight hours. Here's the wind power generation for the first three days of September 2020. The pattern is different on every single day, and on some days the total generation is significantly lower than others. When you attempt to power a grid entirely using renewables, you have to think of those times when generation is low for extended periods. 
Sure, you could maybe power the entire country by renewables for a whole day when there are strong winds blowing across the entire country and the sun is shining in midsummer. But what about midwinter, when the skies have been cloudy for a fortnight and the wind is nowhere to be seen? How much energy storage would you need to include in order to cover for that eventuality? What would that cost? If you're still not sold on this argument, then imagine doing this entire process for yourself, just for your own home. Imagine attempting to power your house only by solar power. How many panels would you need? And how much storage to get through winter on 100% solar power, assuming that you might get weeks of virtually no generation at all? And what would that cost? The first panels are cheap and generate almost entirely useful energy, but studies show that after about 30% of your energy is generated by unpredictable intermittent renewable sources, then they do start getting much more expensive. Getting to 60 or 70% is achievable, maybe even 80%, but it's very expensive. But getting to 100% is almost impossible without a colossal amount of expenditure and vast overproduction to ensure that we can handle the worst possible case. We'll revisit this argument, as I'm sure you've already guessed, in the next lecture when covering nuclear power, because what we really need to solve this problem is something that will cover that 30 or 40% where renewables are really not that well suited the dark, windless winter days. But there are other renewable sources that could cover those eventualities. Let's take a look at those. We've seen that powering our country entirely with unpredictable sources isn't quite as easy as we would like. So what other renewable sources exist and could they solve the problem? Well, we have a few options and in some situations they can help enormously, but they're all rather geographically variable. Hydropower is the largest renewable energy source globally as you can see from this chart, generating roughly twice as much power as wind and solar combined. Hydropower requires flowing water from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, so it requires either existing large rivers, which must be dammed, causing potential widespread environmental damage, or else it requires lakes, which already exist at altitude, which means it requires mountainous terrain. Norway, for example, is perfectly suited for this, and hydropower generates more than 90% of Norway's power, for Morocco or Saudi Arabia, say, the prospects would be less enticing. Tidal power is also a predictable source of energy. All through the seasons, the tide goes out and comes in as regular as clockwork, caused by the moon's orbit around the Earth. Energy can be extracted from this in a similar way to hydropower, by exploiting the massive amount of water being essentially lifted to a higher elevation and then flowing back down again. And you can use that to turn turbines. This works well in places with a high tidal range between low and high tide, like Britain, but less well in the Mediterranean, for example, where tidal ranges are very low. Coupled with tidal power is the idea of wave power, which has never really taken off to any great degree, and which is certainly more variable as it relies on the height and frequency of waves to generate power by the movement of floating generators. Geothermal power is an excellent choice for countries like Iceland, which are situated in areas of high volcanic activity. Water is pumped underground, heated by the Earth's internal heat, pumped back to the surface as steam, drives power turbines and cools down again. Iceland generates basically 100% of its electricity this way. In countries without any volcanic resource to speak of, however, the task is significantly harder. It can be done, but it's much less efficient. The last on this list is biomass. This is a tricky one, as biomass strictly involves the burning of plants or plant products. That might be through ethanol made from corn or soy, or just from burning wood from sustainable forests. Though it does obviously emit CO2 into the atmosphere, it's considered carbon neutral because the CO2 is taken out of the atmosphere when growing the crop to be burned. Hence the actual atmospheric levels remain constant over a sufficiently long time span. The problem with burning coal and oil is that the CO2 being released was previously buried underground and had not been in the atmosphere for millions of years, whereas in biomass generation it was in the atmosphere already and was pulled out briefly into a plant, then released again. Biomass also obviously isn't going to run out, we can continue to grow new crops. Biomass obviously has its detractors. For one, it requires a vast amount of land to grow the crops to be burned and we currently need all the arable land we can get in order to grow food to feed all the humans. This report from MIT estimates that sugarcane might be able to generate 400 gigajoules per hectare per year. Put in context, 
400 gigajoules per hectare per year is about 11 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which is about 1.3 watts per square meter, 30% less than you get from solar panels, and with significantly more energy intensive processing required. The benefit of having a liquid fuel that can be stored in tanks and piped around over long distances does obviously have some advantages given our existing infrastructure. But biofuels seem like a non starter to me, especially in countries where we can't grow sugarcane, so we're stuck with crops that are many times less energy dense and we don't have much arable land to spare anyway. We've covered a lot in this lecture, and I wanted to make sure in the summary that I haven't given the wrong impression of renewable energy. I love renewable energy. Renewables are a vital part of our energy mix, and in countries where they're well suited, then certain renewables have the possibility to generate a very significant fraction of the required electricity demand. But in other countries, where the geography doesn't really help, then the overall potential for renewables is less stellar. But we should always use every tool in our toolkit. There is no one correct way to generate power that we need to copy to all countries across the world. This is very much a matter of picking what works, where it works, and using all the renewable sources as much as it makes sense to do so. We've learned that renewables are extremely cheap at low levels, but once they start generating a significant fraction of the grid power, then intermittent sources of renewable energy like solar and wind power can get very expensive indeed because they have to be supported by grid storage, which we'll definitely talk about in a later presentation. We've also learned that there are more predictable renewable sources, but they are much more geographically limited, so cannot be considered as solutions in general to provide low carbon energy globally. That's the end of this presentation. I hope you learned something useful and that you continue to join me on this journey through the world of eco-modernism. Next time we'll approach that well-known enemy of environmental activists, nuclear power, and work out whether it's actually as scary as it's often portrayed, or if it might actually be a useful component of a clean energy mix. We'll cover the history of this technology, how it actually works, and the cutting-edge designs that are being proposed with 21st century science. Until then, thanks for watching.